It is really exciting to be here in this outdoor sanctuary that we have. Isn't this wonderful? Yeah. Yeah, let's give it up for God. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. If you just look around, it's just gorgeous out here, and it's really cool. Cool in, as in neat and also cool as in the temperature is a little cold, so sit closer to the people that you came with, zip up your jackets, do whatever you need to do to be comfortable as we worship. Um, just a few things before we get started with our worship. Uh, being outside in the fresh air is ideal during this pandemic. And y'all have done a wonderful job wearing your mask, washing your hands, keeping distance. And so we really appreciate that and ask that you continue to keep the masks on as we worship. But please sing. Don't let the mask hinder your singing uh, together. As And hopefully you have the song sheets that were passed out by the ushers. And if for some reason we missed you, raise your hand and we'll be happy to come to you and hand you a song sheet. Also want to mention that right after our service tonight, our center jazz band is going to lead us in some songs and play some music for us as a kind of special time of music afterwards. So if you're able, please stick around for that fun time. Now, prepare your hearts and your minds for the worship of God. just want to let everyone know that there's a small typo in the call to worship in the all. It just would be the depths of the seas. So friends, please rise, embody your spirit, and join in our call to worship. Come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise to God with songs of praise. For, For God, God is great. In God's hands are the expanse of the earth, the heights of the mountains the depths of the seas, and everything in them. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For we are God's handiwork, the fruit of God's garden. Come, friends, open yourself to the uniqueness of this time and space as we worship God together. Okay, so you heard Hayes say that you're welcome to sing, I, and I really invite you to do that. If you can sing better standing up, do it. If you can sing better sitting down, do it. This is your time and your worship time. All right, and, and it's a chorus that we don't sing very often, so I just want to teach it to you real quickly. It's over my head, I hear music in the air. Over my head, I hear music in the air. Over my head. I hear music in the air, there must be a God somewhere. Okay, and then I'm going to sing some verses, and I'll say something like, And when the world is silent, and you can sing, I hear music in the air. Oh, when the world is silent, I hear music in the air. When the world is silent, I hear music in the air. And then robustly, there must be a God somewhere. And that'll take us back into the refrain. You'll catch on to it. You'll love it. And if you have to do this when you say over my head, then you're welcome to do that too. All right, let's worship God. Oh, when I feel 
feeling lonely. So friends, as we celebrate and are able to sing together for the first time in a long time, I wanted to add as much music to our service as possible. Now Hayes mentioned to you that following the end of the service, we'll continue with some music. You're welcome to stay. If you're cold, you're welcome to leave. You don't have to torture yourself to be nice to us. Um, but this is your choice. But for our prayer time this evening, we're going to hear a song that has an incredible message to it from Deborah Savage. No one believes 
Friends, hear this good news. In a world where there are broken hearts, where we mostly fall, sometimes run, and there are sorrows, there is also great mercy. In the name of mercy, I declare to you all, you are a beloved child of God. You are. You and everyone here and everybody in the world is a beloved child of God. Celebrate that. And if you're able, let us stand and join in our song of response. holding up okay? Do we need to run inside and get out of the element? All right. We, we are hearty folk here. We don't leave that up to the Midwesterners. We can do it here in sunny South California. All right. Our, our scripture reading this evening will be the first of several stories that we're going to read over the next few weeks from the book of Acts. We're reading from Acts chapter 8. We're going to read from verse 46 through verse from verse 26 through 40. Listen for the word of God. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's a wilderness road. So Philip got up and went. Now, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah, and the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran to it and heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah, and he, he, he said, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb, silent, before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, 
About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? Uh, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak. And starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's water. What's preventing me from being baptized? So he commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, got down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. This ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, as we hear this story, as we listen in on how the early church was faithful to their call, as we join Philip and this Ethiopian treasurer on their journey, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit is saying to your church today. Amen. So as I mentioned, uh, for the next few weeks we're going to be looking at stories from the book of Acts. These are stories of the early church. And we call it among ourselves the book of Acts, but the official title, I guess if it were, is Acts of the Apostles. I don't know who named it that, but I think it could have been better done. Um, particularly for our story, because our story is about Philip, who's not an apostle. He's a leader of the church that was elected by the community, just like many of our own leaders are elected by the community. He wasn't one of the twelve that walked around with Jesus for how many years and, and was trained specifically. He, he was, a, he was a, a, a spirit-filled member of the church. So it's not an act of the apostle in this story. It's an act of someone who is not an apostle. And, and I also think it's a little bit of a misnomer because as we read these stories, the thing that really sticks out is that the most active agent in all of these stories are not the apostles. It's the Holy Spirit. So if I were in charge for a day, I would change the name of this book. I, aren't you a little scared at that thought? If I were in charge for a day, I would change the name of this book to the Acts of the Church Empowered by the Spirit. That's what these stories are all about. And those are the stories we're going to hear. And you know what the interesting thing about that is? That we're a church empowered by the Spirit. So we're not listening to heroic stories from once upon a time. We're listening to our stories. This is our spirit. These, these are our ways of being in the world. So with that in mind, I invite you to look again at the story of Philip that we've just read. <clears throat> and particularly, I want to look at what it tells us through its form and then what it says through its content. I want to think about the form and the content. Because the form of the story is that Philip does not plan any of this. You, you heard me as the story began. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go and stand on a wilderness road. In other words, go out into the middle of nowhere and stand there. And, and Philip doesn't know what's going to happen. Philip doesn't plan what's going to happen. They haven't had a strategic study of the religiosity of people in the middle of the road. They haven't done any of that stuff. He's just told, go out in the middle of the road, and Philip obeys. That's how the story begins. Got nothing to do with Philip's ingenuity, just his obedience. And as somebody who's kind of feeling like they're running short on ingenuity these days, I'm really lifted up by that. The, the, the church's work is not dependent on us being clever. Philip just obeys. The Spirit says, the, the Spirit says to Philip, go out in the middle of nowhere. So he's standing on this road from Jerusalem to Gaza, a, a deserted road, we're told. And suddenly, a first century Rolls Royce comes pulling up, right? A chariot. You haven't seen those in any of the gospel stories because none of those poor people could afford one, right? So this is somebody coming up the street in a chariot and Philip sees the person and it's an Ethiopian eunuch. 
I try to stay away from the topic of eunuchs, just like I try to stay away from the topic of circumcision as much as possible. But this was a first century reality. And it was a castration that was often performed on men who would be serving high-powered women in some way or another just to keep them safe. And if you think that's brutal or uh, primordial or, or, or prehistoric or something, just imagine how much better off we'd be if movie producers or presidents or uh, CEOs were required to be eunuchs. I, I think we'd all be a little safer, um, but we'll save that for another day. Okay, so you have this eunuch, and the reason he is that is because he's in charge of the entire treasury of Ethiopia, working with the queen. This is, this is a very, very high-powered person, probably the highest reigning person we've seen in these stories. And he's coming up the road on a chariot. And again, Philip has nothing to do with any of this. And just to show you the form that we're going to see over and over again in these stories in the book of Acts, he's reading the Bible. He's, he's already religious. He's coming back from Jerusalem where he's gone to worship. So either he's a descendant of an earlier diaspora where his folks have been living in Ethiopia for many years, or maybe he was carried off as a slave many years ago, or maybe he's a Jewish convert from Ethiopia. We don't know the whole backstory. We just know that Philip told to stand in the middle of the road, along comes his Rolls Royce, carrying a very high-ranking official who happens to be returning home from worship in Jerusalem. So he shares that kind of uh, basis of religion with Philip, and he's reading the Bible. So when Philip is called into this evangelism story, we often think that the church, by its cleverness and by its design, makes all of this happen. But notice the work of the Spirit. This guy's already 90% there. He's already a God worshiper who's reading the Bible. And so that's when Philip goes and says, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I do that without a companion? Hop in. And Philip is able to, dis to describe for him the, the story of the Christ, and he becomes baptized. It's a beautiful story, but notice the form. And the form is consistent throughout the book of Acts that it's not the church's ingenuity, but it's the preparation of the Spirit that makes these things happen. And that's good for us, <laughs> because it tells us we don't have to be the smartest, and we don't have to have the greatest music program, and we don't have to have the biggest, splashiest pastors, and we don't have to have this, and we don't have to have that, in order to be an effective evangelistic church. It just means that we need to listen to the Spirit, because there's that key moment in the story when Philip hears this Ethiopian official reading the scriptures and the Spirit says to him, go over to the chariot and join it. Go over and join it. And that's what the Spirit says to the church. When the Spirit has been preparing the world for the gospel, go over and do what are, join what's already happening. That's the good news here for us. But it leaves us a little befuddled. <laughs> because in the story, the Spirit seems to whisper in, in Philip's ear, right? Go over and join it. And not many of us have the experience of the Spirit whispering in our ear. If, we, if it does, we feel kind of weird about it. And uh, we're never sure if that's the Spirit tugging us in that direction or if that's just our niggling, uh, angling feeling, and maybe we're just blaming it on God or something. We're, we're, we're never quite sure what the voice of the Spirit versus the voice of our own inner thoughts are. And that's why we also need to look at the content of the story, because that will help us discern when it is that the Spirit is calling us into an action that's already taking place, okay? And the content of the story is this. As that official is going down the road, he's not just on a general religious quest, and he's not just reading some random portion of Scripture. He's reading from Isaiah, chapter 53. 
In fact, I would encourage you when you go home tonight, if you have a chance or sometime this weekend, to look at the entire chapter of Isaiah, chapter 53. That's the portion of the scroll that this Ethiopian eunuch is reading. It's powerful, and it fits into that category of scriptures that we call the stories of the suffering servant. And they don't make sense. They don't make sense to this high-ranking official. He reads it, and it says, Like a sheep he was led to the shearers, and, and, and like a lamb he was silent. And in his humiliation, in his humiliation, justice was denied him. And, and the Ethiopian official is just befuddled by this because that's not how things work. This is not how God saves the world is through somebody stumbling around being denied justice and humiliated and so forth. The Ethiopian official, even though he's been to, to Jerusalem, he's celebrated, even though he's a seeker looking for the presence of God, he has also been trained in our world's way of thinking that it's power that accomplishes not suffering. We believe in the myth of redemptive power instead of the myth of redemptive suffering. And he's reading a story from Isaiah 53 that's all about the suffering servant who is God's Messiah. The suffering servant who accomplishes God's mission. The suffering servant who brings redemption to the world. It's, it, it, it's the story of the cross that the Apostle Paul says is... is it just seems like a stumbling block to the pious and foolishness to the powerful. Because it doesn't make sense. Our world teaches us that it's with power that we take control of the world, with power that we make change. It's power that brings transformation. And here is the scripture saying it's through suffering that the world is changed. And that's why Philip climbs up into that chariot and has the opportunity to tell this Ethiopian official about Jesus Christ who was put to death wrongly who in his humiliation justice was denied him and whose death was a redemptive death for you and for me so when we look at this story and, and it's our story it's a story about our spirit calling our church into the world from the form of the story, what it tells us is we listen for what the Spirit is doing in the world and we go over and join it. From the content of the story, it tells us, it answers that question for us, but how do we know that it's the Spirit at work in the world and not just our own cleverness? How do we know it's the Spirit at work in the world, not just our own prejudice? How do we know it's the Spirit? And the way we know it's the Spirit is that God is working through the oppressed. And God is working through the humble. And God is working in ways that are contrary and foolish to the powerful in our world. They are astounding to the powerful in our world. Even someone like this Ethiopian treasurer, as religious as he is, cannot wrap his head around the fact that God's way of redemption is a way of redemptive suffering. And that's the foolishness of the cross to which you and I are called to proclaim. The foolishness of the cross is that it's in our humility, it's in our service, it's in our solidarity with those who are hungry and those who are powerless and those who are exploited and those who are left out. It's when we leave the comfort of our power circles and we join with those who are oppressed in this world that we are actively living in what the Spirit is doing in the world. When we hear that word, go over to the chariot and join it, what we hear is, go speak truth to power. Go speak a truth that proclaims the suffering death of Christ as God's way of redemptive love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
You may be seated. Friends, the last time that we came to this table and broke bread together on a Saturday evening was February 29th, last year. That is a long time for us. The perk, though, of being gathered by the eternal God is that God is not constrained by time. So today we will use the same liturgy as we always have to celebrate the Lord's Supper, to pick up right where we left off uh, over a year ago. I invite all of you to find your song sheets and locate the song, God is Great, which we will sing together as part of our prayer of thanksgiving. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from north and from south, from east and from west to sit at God's table. May God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your graciousness and your mercy for the world that you have made that you have infused with life and vitality. We thank you for giving us the imprint of your own divine image. We thank you for your church, the body of Christ whom you have called and empowered to be the the world's voice and offering praise. Hear us as we sing our joy. who are sick, imprisoned, or despairing without hope, Lord, we pray for healing and for wholeness. For those whose relationships are torn, we pray for reconciliation. For those who are living in fear or in violence, we pray for strength and for freedom. For those whose lives are bound by addictions or mental illnesses, we pray for release. O God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For honor, glory, and power are yours forever. Amen. Friends, on the night of Jesus' betrayal, he sat in the upper room with with his disciples. He took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood that has been poured out for the forgiveness of all sins. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We invite our servers to come forward. Thank you, Deborah and Kathy. Friends, in a moment, you'll be invited to come forward and to one of our two stations. And the first thing you'll do is you'll line up six feet apart. And when it's your turn, you'll sanitize your hands with some of the sanitizer that's here. 
you'll come to the bread and Kathy or Deborah will place a piece of bread in your palm. So have your hand out ready. And then you'll serve yourself at one of these two uh, stations and grab yourself the wine and you'll take both of them back to your seats. And then after everybody has gone through the lines and is seated with their elements, we will invite you to take the bread first together and then we'll take the juice together, okay? The table is set, my friends. All are welcome here. Come and see that the Lord is indeed good. Friends, this is the body of Christ broken for us. And this is the cup of salvation poured out for all. Drink ye all of it. Will you please pray with me? Gracious God, you have accepted us just as we are, weak or strong, wounded or fit, free or bound. You have nourished us at this table, your table, and promised to be our strength throughout our lives. Amen. Friends, Friends you're welcome to stay seated or stand as we sing our last song together, God be the love to search and keep me.
friends, you're welcome to stay for a while, listen to the music. You're welcome to go if you're not comfortable. Um, whether you stay or go, as you leave this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the companionship of God's own spirit be with each of you from this day and forevermore. Amen.